Now the most important thing in our service this morning, let us turn to the word of God and hear what God would say to us. 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. <clears throat> reading in verse 1, I'm reading from the New International Version. Your text might be slightly different, but I'm sure you can follow. 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel? And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he called you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until the morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel said, here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God be, deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father, we desire this morning that your word would come to us. We desire that as you spoke personally to Samuel, you would speak personally to us today. We thank you from the depths of our hearts that you are a God who speaks, a God who reveals yourself, a God who is interested in us. And we pray that in this sense, we might hear your voice then directing our lives today. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. A great scientific project is underway at this point in time. A number of months ago, uh, national scientists began to focus great instruments out into space. Signals are being sent out into the reaches of space at this point in time to see if there's anyone out there on any of the far-reaching galaxy systems of this universe who are intelligent beings who may listen to these signals being sent from Earth, and they in turn may send signals back to us. We are not only sending those signals out, but we are listening to see if there's anyone out there who is seeking to communicate with us. A great scientific project at this very point in time. Isn't it interesting to realize that somewhere out there in this vast universe, there is someone who is speaking to people upon planet Earth, and that someone is the God of this universe. God has been and God is speaking. And I wonder if we are 
as ready to listen and anxious to listen as our scientific community is today to signals from outer space. God is a God who speaks to us and a God who wants to catch our attention and a God who wants to uh, impact our lives for good and for blessing. This is clearly the page of scripture this morning that speaks about listening to God. For Samuel, there was a great personal need. Notice it says in verse one, it says in those days the word of the Lord was rare. God's word was not being heard very uh, much by the people in that day. One reason we've noticed is because the priesthood was corrupt and God was not able to speak to those whom he would normally speak through. And so there was not uh, a very profuse uh, speaking forth of the word of God in that day. Not only so in general was that the condition, but specifically for Samuel, if you'll notice in verse 7, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So he was living in a condition, generally speaking, where the word of God was not uh, readily spoken, and he was living personally for himself in that condition as well. He was a young boy, of course, growing up, and God had not yet spoken to him. He not, did not yet realize in a personal way that God's voice was for him and that God had something for him to do. So there was a great need for the nation and a great need for Samuel at that point in time. There is that great need for our nation today. There is that great need for our world today that in the midst of all the clamoring voices of this age in which we live, that the word of God would sound forth authoritatively and clearly and that people would understand that we need to hear what God says and we need to respond to God's word for us at the end of the ages in which we are presently living. So the need is the same. And there may be some one of you as an individual and it may be said for you as it was for Samuel, the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him or to her. Maybe you haven't realized that God wants to speak to you personally that his word, the scripture, is for you as an individual, that God is interested in you as an individual of all the four or five billion people living on this earth today. God is interested in you in a personal way and that God wants to speak to you in your need and to bring blessing and hope into your life. Now the possibility of God speaking to us is set before us in many ways in scripture. I've listed this morning, I think it is eight ways here in which God has spoken and does speak to us. How does the Lord speak to us? Well, first of all, he spoke to some people audibly, by voice. That's the way he spoke to Samuel on this occasion. A, an audio, audible voice of God spoke to Samuel and Samuel heard of God's voice speaking to him. Now that's not usual, but it was quite much more common in the Old Testament days than in these days. And God could, if he wished, speak audibly to any one of us at any time. And that's the way he spoke many times in the Old Testament. For example, in Genesis chapter 22, God spoke to Abraham and God told Abraham that he was to take his son to Mount Moriah and so on. God spoke not only on that occasion, but on many occasions to Abraham audibly. Moses at the beginning of his ministry saw a burning bush and he couldn't understand what was happening and the voice of God came to him out of that burning bush. So God spoke to Moses and impelled him into that great ministry of delivering the people of God. And God spoke to Joshua. If you turn to Joshua chapter one verse one you'll see at the very beginning of his ministry. God spoke to Joshua and commissioned him to carry on the work of God. So God does, God can speak audibly if he so pleases. And that's the way he spoke many times in the Old Testament times. God also spoke by vision in the Old Testament times. Visions or dreams. And God still can speak through visions or dreams should he, should he so choose. He spoke to Joseph many times in dreams in the Old Testament scripture. He spoke to Peter as recorded in Acts chapter 10 when he wanted the, the word of God, the gospel of God, the grace of God to go out from the Jewish people to Gentiles throughout the world. God gave a vision to Peter. You remember of a, a sheet being let down from heaven and all kinds of wild beasts being in that sheet. And God told Peter to rise and eat. And Peter said, no, I'm not going to eat of that unclean meat and so on. God says, well, I cleanse. Don't you call unclean and so on. He put the whole thing together and was saying to Peter at that time, look, I'm going to cleanse the Gentiles. 
I'm going to bring them into my church and bring them into my family. He spoke to Peter dramatically and forcibly by a vision on that occasion. He spoke not only to Peter uh, through a vision on that occasion, but he spoke to Paul as uh, he began uh, to move the gospel to the Western world. You remember he came to the uh, edge of the Aegean Sea, and uh, Paul received what we now call the Macedonian vision, in which he saw a man of Greece who was saying, come over and help us. The gospel at that time had only been in what we call the Near East. But now for the first time, and for your blessing and my blessing, it moved west. And it came about because God spoke to Paul through a vision. The whole last book in the Bible is God speaking to John through visions. So God may speak. God has spoken. God can speak through dreams and visions if he so desires. That's one of the means that he uses. God also speaks through nature. In Psalm 19, uh, you remember how that God uh, speaks through nature. Let me just read a verse or two of that for you. In Psalm 19, where it says... You get the right page here. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There's no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the earth. This is one way by which all men may have some knowledge of God. Because God speaks through the created universe. And God tells us that he's a God of wisdom. He's a God of power. He's a God of beauty. He's a God of design. And so God speaks. Regardless of the human language, he speaks through the language of nature. Telling us that he is a mighty, a wise, and a gracious and loving God. So God speaks through nature. God may speak through providential events. Let me read to you a verse in Job chapter 33. Listen to this. For God does speak, not one way, and now one way. God does speak, now one way, now another. Though men may not perceive it. In a dream, we've spoken about that. Then going down, it says in verse 19, For a man may be chastened on a bed of pain, with constant distress in his bones, so that his very being finds food repulsive. His soul loatheth the choicest meat, and so on. God sometimes speaks through providential events. Sometimes it is through a bed of sickness. Sometimes it is through an accidental happening that comes about in the near family. Sometimes it's through the death of a loved one. Sometimes it's through uh, situations that are totally beyond my control and totally beyond my explaining. God speaks through providential events. I remember in my own uh, lifetime as I went into the military off the college campus, uh, not a believer at that time, went down to Tyler, Texas and was involved in the basic training of, uh, of infantry units down there. And at the end of that period of time, when everybody would be shipped out to various units, my name being W down at the end of the alphabet, everybody else up to W, X, Y, and Z was shipped out of the place. And there I was left relatively alone. All of my friends were gone. All of the guys that I was having fun with and having an ongoing uh, life with, uh, they were all gone. So there I was for two weeks with nothing to do. And what did I do with nothing to do? Well, what I did was began to think. And what did I think about? I began to think about the things of eternity because we were in a hot war at that point in time. Providential circumstances separated me from the normal flow of life. It was as if God picked me up, sat me down, and said, now I want to talk to you. God sometimes speaks through providential circumstances. You remember Saul of Tarsus as Stephen, that mighty proclaimer of the gospel of God, stood and gave his defense and spoke about God's uh, wonderful grace to the people of Israel in the Old Testament times and how he sent Moses to the people and they rejected Moses, but later on Moses became the deliverer of the people. How that uh, God had, had uh, sent Joseph among the people and his brothers rejected Joseph, but Joseph became the savior of the people. And now Stephen says, God has sent Jesus. You have rejected Jesus, but Jesus will be the savior and the only savior. And the people were cut to the heart by the power of Stephen's message. And as Stephen gave that message, the Bible says his, angel was, his face was like the face of an angel. I don't know what that is like. But I assume it was the glory of God shone out upon his face. And uh, Saul of Tarsus, the leading 
antagonist of the church of Jesus Christ was standing there. He saw that. He heard that. And the men who stoned Stephen to death laid their clothes down at Saul's feet. You can't tell me that that wasn't a shaft of conviction that struck to the heart of Saul of Tarsus. And just within the space of a few months after that, Saul of Tarsus becomes a believer in Jesus Christ. God sometimes speaks through providential events in our lives. May I suggest this morning, if things are tough, if things are going in a way that you don't want them to go, you can't understand what's happening, things seem out of control, things that you can't explain are coming into your life, maybe, just maybe, God is speaking to you and trying to catch your attention, my friend, that you might hear his voice speaking to you in your need this morning and this day. So God sometimes speaks through providential events. God speaks also through the prophets. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us that in various times in past, God spoke in various means through many prophets to the people of God. The great prophets of the Old Testament, you know their names, Isaiah and Jeremiah and uh, Daniel and uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Jonah, so on and so forth. All these great prophets of the Old Testament speaking forth the word of God, proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. And even today, we don't have many prophets in that sense, although we may have some. God is able to give prophets any time he wishes to do so. But we do have proclaimers of the word of God, those who preach what God has said and can say, thus saith the Lord, and read it right out of Holy Scripture. God speaks through those who sound forth the word of God. God speaks through his Son. He speaks ultimately and completely and fully. His fullest message is given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. The son, the Lord Jesus Christ, should say, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, it could be said of him in John's prologue, chapter 1, verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time, but the only begotten, the only unique son of God, Jesus, he has declared him. He has expressed him. He has brought God into focus. So if we want to know who God is and what God is like and what God wants to do, we look at Jesus because the Lord Jesus Christ is God's final great message to men concerning who he is and how he relates to us. Hebrews chapter 1, I already quoted verse 1, God speaking to the prophets, and it says in verse 2, but he hath in these last days spoken to us through his Son. And when God speaks to us through his son, my friend, he's given his final great word to mankind. Oh, look at Jesus. Look at his love. Look at his purity. Look at his compassion. Look at his mercy. Look at his patience. Look at his humbleness. Look at his self-sacrificing love. Look to the cross and you see what God wants to say to you. He says, I love you. I love you. I love you. God has spoken to us through his son. God also speaks to us through inspired scripture. The Holy Scriptures, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 15 and 16, tell us are the inspired word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. What does that mean? Well, it's a word that simply means <sighs> exhale. When you breathe, you inhale and you <sighs> exhale. And the word inspired there means exhaled. All the word of God is breathed out by God. All the word of God, all of Holy Scripture is the breath of God, breathed out. It originates with God. He used men to convey it, but it comes from God. No prophecy is of personal origination, as Peter tells us. But every word of God initiates in the heart of God and coming mysteriously and miraculously through men whose names are upon the page of Scripture, God gives us his word, the inspired Scripture. I just want to stop here my message just a little bit, just a moment, and tell you, my friend, that God wants to speak to you. Generally speaking, this is the way he's going to speak to you. He may speak to you through dreams. He may speak to you through providential circumstances. He may speak to you audibly in some voice that you will hear. But generally speaking, today God will speak to you through his holy word. 
And I want to tell you the one thing you want to do in your life above everything else is to get yourself into the Word of God. Saturate, saturate yourself in the Word of God. All of my lifetime, I have been by the providence of God brought up in a Christian home into the Word of God. But for the last 50 years of my life as a believer, I have intensively and intentionally been into the Word of God. I want to hear what God says. And this is what we need today, to hear what God says, to direct our lives according to God's plan and God's purpose and to respond to God's will for our lives. How are we going to do that unless we get into the Word of God? How do you get into the Word of God? First of, God, first of all, you read your Bible every day. You read your Bible every day. You heard me. You read your Bible every day. And after you've read it through once, you read it through a second time, and after a second time, a third time, and so on. You keep letting the Word of God filter through, filter, filter through your life into your mind, into your attitudes, into your priorities. Saturate yourself with the Word of God. You memorize the Word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart, said the psalmist, that I might not sin against thee. You memorize the word of God. You study the word of God on your own. You say, I'm going to study the gospel of John. I'm going to take a study of the Psalms or whatever it is. There are all kinds of aids and helps and tools to enable you today compared to 50 years ago to get into the personal study of God's word. Set yourself time to do that. You take time to go to school, and thank God you do, to increase your expertise so that your job professionally will be better as you go along in the course of life. That's important. Do that. You take time for your garden. I do that. You take time for your recreation, golf. I do that. You take time for this and that and other. Do you take time for the Word of God? Are you intentionally studying God's Word? That's how God speaks to us today is through his word. Not only so, but you hear sermons and you read books which are about the word of God. You enter into dialogue with fellow Christians about the word of God. And you just expose yourself in every possible way to the word of God. God speaks through inspired scripture. And God speaks, and I have to be very careful here, God speaks by an inner voice. Now God speaks by an inner voice. What do I mean by that? Well, in Acts chapter 16, as I've noted on your outline sheet, verses 6 and 7, it says God forbade the apostles on their missionary journey to go to the north. He forbade them to go to the south. How did he do that? We don't know. He may have done that by having a prophet say, Thus saith the Lord, you're not to go into, the, into this northern area. You're not to go into this southern area. He might have done that. But he might also have done it by giving an impelling inner consciousness, a voice of God within the heart of the apostle and the others, that this was not God's will to go here or there. I know that God speaks in a quiet inner voice. Now, when God speaks in a quiet inner voice, this is a subjective aspect of God speaking to us. It is never, you got it, capital letters, N-E-V-E-R, never, and it's underlined three times. It is never contrary to the written word of God. Never contrary to the written word of God. So that anything that God says to you in your secret times of communion and fellowship with the Lord, when you just know that you're in the presence of God and that God is speaking to you, is never, ever contrary to the written word of God. But on the other hand, it's very real as you walk close with God and live close to him. He may speak to you personally in an inner voice. Back in the war years, as we were outside Zarbrucken at the Siegfried Line, we pounded the line for a day before the jump off at that point, and exhausted and worn out, after the breakthrough was finally achieved, a lot of us just lay down anywhere to sleep. I did. I woke up out of that sleep, and the inner voice of God said to me, Move. 
go over somewhere else. Don't stay here. I did what I felt God spoke to me. And two or three minutes after that, the particular area where I was was smashed to pieces by incoming artillery. And I would not be here this morning if I did not respond to the inner voice of God. That was the clearest indication I ever had in my life of God speaking to me in an inner voice. A number of years ago, I was involved in planting a church in Swansea, Massachusetts, which still goes on to, for the glory, glory of the Lord there. And also involved in the work of the church here, of course. And uh, at the one particular evening, I remember driving back from Swansea, Massachusetts, where things had been established and were going well. And uh, it was as if, again, God was speaking to me in my heart and saying, your work here now is finished. And on the other hand, I have something else for you to do. And that was the voice of God speaking to my heart. And I got home, having been away for three days, I think it was, and I looked at the mail, and there was a letter. And the letter was from a woman by the name of Freedom Mills down in Darien, Connecticut. And in the letter it said, we are having gospel meetings on Sunday night in the home of Mark Isley. Now, I know none of these people. And we hear that you preach the gospel. We want you to come and preach the gospel to us. And I felt that God was bringing together an inner voice who had spoken to me and providential circumstances. And I responded and went and we saw another church established there in the other end of the state. So the speaking of God to the spirit of those who are in fellowship with him is very real and uh, very definite. And uh, sometimes God speaks to us in that way. But it is never, ever contrary to the written word of God. Now, what is Samuel's response to all of this here in connection with God speaking to him? The first thing we must notice is the authority of God's word. We respond when God speaks to us only when we recognize and when we affirm the authority of God's word. Otherwise, we hear other voices or we do what we wish. But when we are committed to the fact that this is in fact the word of the living God of this universe, this is the word of God, then we're in a position to respond in a positive way. That's the first issue you have to deal with in your life. Every one of us will be agnostic. We can't know unless God has spoken. And if God has spoken and we affirm in fact that this is the message of God to us, then my friend, when God says something, I'm ready to respond because of who he is who speaks. You know, when I was a little boy growing up, you know, if my buddy said something, okay, maybe yes and maybe no. You know, if my brother said something, sure as anything, I was going, yeah, 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 and run the other way, see? But when my father said something or my mother said something, that was it. So when God speaks, see? So the first thing we have to be clear about is the authority of the word of God. Notice in verse three, it says the word of the Lord was rare. Notice in verse seven, it says the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. Notice in verse 21, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there revealed himself to Samuel through his word. So the whole thing develops because Samuel recognized the authority of the voice. He recognized it was the Lord who was speaking to him. That's very important in the day and age in which, we, I mean that is so important. The media is so strong and so powerful. The pressure of our world, the social world, is so great. And the business world and practices are so strong that unless I am hearing the authoritative word of God, I am going to slip into the stream of practice and behavior and lifestyle of this world in which I am living. The only way a young person is going to stand up against the rise of drugs and alcohol and sexuality, sexual activity in the high school and college campus is to recognize the authority of the word of God and to do what God says in contrast to what the culture is doing. Now, I'm very concerned about this whole thing, and I know you are too. 
Keith Price, who was here for our Bible conference just recently, we had lunch together and spent almost a whole lunch time talking about this very fact. The fact that in our lifetime we have seen the church slip away from the centrality and the authority and emphasis upon the Word of God. Now, he gave me about four reasons. He wrote an article on it. They were in the article he had, and he renumerated them to me. I said, Keith, I could give you six more evidences of that fact. And so he said, hey, please send them to me. And I sent them off. And uh, so now he has 10 points for his little uh, emphasis. But we're both concerned. And all, I think, of those who have their eyes open to what's happening are concerned about the slipping away of the centrality and the authority of the word of God within the, within the church today. How does that happen? Well, it happens by reinterpretation of Scripture. One of the great phenomena of the Christian church in the last 20 years is the reinterpretation of Scripture. After centuries of interpreting Scripture, now we come up with whole new, whole new bizarre interpretations of Scripture, which are basically accommodations to the culture in which we are living. They are not impacting the culture with the Word of God, but they are sliding into being culturized, the Word of God being culturized, brought into our culture. This has to do with extreme feminism, for example. It has to do with a whole broad subject of sexuality. It has to do with a broad subject of the sanctity of life. So that even within churches where the word of God is preached today, even for people who believe that, yes, this is the word of God, we find them living in the style of a, word, of a world who has rejected the word of God. Either what God says is, in fact, the very truth of God that must be clung to is a center and foundation of our very life. It was that which brought about the great reformation in the Middle Ages. Either we must cling and get back to a centrality of the word of God in our personal lives and in our church lives, the proclaiming and pronouncing of thus saith the Lord, or the church becomes like the world. Chuck Colson speaks adequately to this subject is another great national and international proclaimer of the truth that I speak of this morning. Secondly, in our response, we must notice the personal nature of God's word. The personal nature of God's word. Samuel, 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 Samuel. We must understand that God wants to speak to me. Oh, you know, <laughs> I really wish that Susie could have been here this morning. She really needed to hear that. Well, maybe so. But I need to hear that. See? We oftentimes are thinking about who else needs to hear this. Preachers are oftentimes preparing sermons for somebody else. Lord, speak to me. I need your word. I need you to critique me. I need you to direct me. I need you to guide me. When we sit down to our devotions, the very first thing is, Lord, Holy Spirit of God, speak to my heart this morning. Okay. We must understand the personal nature of the Word of God. Jesus knows all about us, and it's wonderful that he does. He loves us just the same. You love me because you don't know much about me, okay? But Jesus loves me knowing everything about me. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. We must notice also the persistence of God's word. Again and again, the word of the Lord came to Samuel to respond. You know what scared me out of my boots when I became a Christian? What desperately drove me to God in a final surrender to him? I said, oh God, since I was a little child in Sunday school, I'm on my mother's knee. I heard your word. I knew you were speaking to me personally, but Lord, I never responded. And now perhaps it's too late and you've no grace and no mercy for me. But God kept on speaking and kept on speaking and kept on speaking. God is patient. God is loving. God is good. And there's some of you here this morning, some issues in your life and God has been speaking to you for a long time, and you've not been listening, you've not wanted to listen, you've not been responding, 
but God still speaks and he still cares and to the very dying breath he speaks to you and pleads with you to get things right whatever issue it may be we finally find openness to God's word as necessary Jesus said in the New Testament he who has ears let him what? hear he who has ears let him hear Jesus said the wise man is a man who hears my words and does them he's like a man who builds his house on a rock and it stands sure it stands firm it is not only hearing it is not only reading it is not only understanding taking all the study guides we have knowing all the details getting it all together it is responding to the word of God. Samuel said, speak. Your servant is listening. And the message he got was a tough one. The little boy had to go to the old man, 98 years of age, and read God's final proclamation of discipline upon that man. He was afraid, the Bible says. Sure, he was afraid. But he did what God said must be done. How much of God's word do I practice? You know, somebody was saying, it's not what we don't know in the Bible that concerns us or concerns me, the person said. It's not what I don't know in the Bible that concerns me. It's what I do know and don't practice. And that's what concerns me too. Don't worry about everything you don't understand. By the way, ask questions about that. But what do you know and of what I do know, what am I practicing? Well, we've got to finish up very quickly this morning. What hinders my listening? We're living in a secular humanistic culture. That's the first thing. God is not in the thoughts and plans and, the, and uh, programs of the world system in which we live. So we're not customized. We're not, we're not uh, sensitized to hear the voice of God. What are we sensitized to hear? We're sensitized to hear the voice through the, of the media, of the uh, academia. We're culturized to hear the voice of the government. Uh, we're culturized to hear the voice of the, of the liberal uh, uh, social engineers. We're cultured to hear all the wrong things. We must hear the word of God. Secondly, I've already spoken on the fact that many times we're not willing to do the word of God. Thirdly, there are too many voices that we're hearing. You know what the problem is with my hearing aid here? One problem. You, every once in a while I get one of the older fellows slip up to me. Once in a while one of the gals say, well, how does that thing work? I mean, are you satisfied with that? And, and uh, how, how does it go? I say, I'm very satisfied with that. It saves me. It enables me to hear and interact. But you know the one problem? It's when we get out in the fellowship hall or in the foyer and, you know, about 50 people are talking and there's all that background noise, and the one that I'm talking to, I can't hear so good because of all the background noise. That's the problem. Now, they have very expensive ones. I think Reagan had a couple of them that screen all that out. But uh, background noise, too many voices. Oh, folks, this morning, we've got to screen out those other voices. We've got to listen to the voice of God. Just like the early radio sets. Most of you don't remember that, but I do. Boy, folks used to get there right up close to that set. There'd be so much static, so much static. And you had to just tune that thing so finally, everybody finally, they, finally they could hear it. You've got to tune it in very carefully. We need to tune in to God intentionally, intentionally, intentionally. It doesn't happen automatically. Well, what are the results of all this, of Samuel hearing the voice of God and responding to the voice of God? Number one, Samuel came to know the Lord. If you want to come to know the Lord, I trust you do. There's a God in this universe who loves you, my friend, who wants to do you good. If you want to come to know him, it's through listening to his word. He tells you you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. He tells us that God loves sinners. Jesus died on the cross in respect to our sins. The work is all finished. It's all done. 
Salvation is a free gift. You may receive God's pardon and you may be born into God's family. Samuel came to know the Lord. Secondly, Samuel continued to grow in the Lord. Notice that in uh, verse 19, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up. And then in verse 21, the Lord continued to appear at Shiloh and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word, same way. So you see, there's not only the fact that he came to know the Lord, but he continued to grow in the Lord. You know, one problem I find sometimes in evangelical preaching is that becoming a Christian is put so much up front that people think that's all that there is. In other words, what I need to do is to become a Christian. Well, you do need to become a Christian. But is that the end of your experience with God? It's the beginning of your experience with God. That's why Jesus said it's being born again. When your children were born, your grandchildren, was that the end of their life? No, it's the beginning of their lives. So we begin by listening to God's word and trusting Jesus as our Savior. We continue to grow and mature and develop by listening to God's word and putting it into practice. Thirdly, Samuel became a servant of the Lord. We find that he is recognized by all the people as a prophet of the Lord. And uh, the last phrase is Samuel's word came to all Israel. God's word came to Samuel, and through Samuel, God's word went out to the people that surrounded him. You know, that's a wonderful thing, isn't it? There are people where you work, and people where you live, and people in your family, and people on your street. They need to hear the word of God. Now, how are they going to hear the word of God? They're going to hear the word of God through you. By the way you live, your lifestyle. I had a delightful visit this last week with someone who became a Christian. Maybe she's here this morning. If she's not this service, she'll be at the other service. And you know how she became a Christian? Because someone was allowing Christ to live through them next door. And so in this last year, this person became a believer in Jesus Christ. So God's word came to Samuel, and then it went through Samuel. God, listen. God wants to use you as his conduit, as his channel by which his word might come to our world. That's exciting, truly exciting. God speaks. And when God speaks, everyone should listen.